All right. You ready? Well, welcome to Calvary Chapel Hilo tonight. Thanks for joining us. Let's um, open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the ability to worship you and, and the call that you have placed on our lives to, to worship you and to uh, bring glory to your name, to the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus. I just ask, Lord, that you would open our hearts to what you have for us tonight. Um, by your Holy Spirit, speak in this place. Uh, meet with people who are here, who are, who are tuning in to um, seek you, Lord, and to seek you in your word specifically. And so I ask, Lord, that you would once again just do the things that only you can do uh, by your Holy Spirit when, when your children gather and, and dig into your word. So, Lord, we love you. Uh, we praise you. We ask again that the name of Jesus would be glorified in this place and through this time tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so Isaiah chapter 9. Um, I've titled this message tonight, This Same Jesus. Recently, we uh, had Hurricane uh, Milton and, and, and Helene, I believe that was the other one, that hit uh, the east coast of the United States um, earlier this month and, and I think in uh, late September as well. I can't remember the exact dates, but I came across an article today about a guy who um, has a wife and two kids who lives in Florida and who was in his house when the hurricane hit. And um, one of the hurricanes, again, I think, I believe it was Milton, uh, tornadoes started hitting Florida in the midst of this, this hurricane, that the hurricane was producing these gnarly, gnarly tornadoes. And one hit his house directly. And he was... Uh, this this U.S. Today article, USA Today article, talked about how he was um, in what was a, a, a basically a four by four closet that was a, a, a safe room in his house, and it was him and his two kids and his wife, and they were just in there. And then the the thing hits, and it, like doors are coming down on him. And if you've ever been caught in a tornado like that, there's this unbelievable just noise and then downward pressure that's just pushing on you and making your ears pop and making your head feel like it's going to going to explode and he, they they talked about him and his wife talked about in the article how uh, the whole time that they were in there as as much as they could hear they could hear their 6-year-old daughter just saying pray mama pray 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 just keep praying and and, and and they were and these these are Christians and they talked about the the guy talked about how losing all this stuff sure it, it's hard and it and it means something right but in the grand scheme, grand scheme of things he recognized that it that it means it means nothing he had his wife and he had his children and the people he cared about were were still alive and and they talked about having the Lord and 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 their faith um, I, I came across another article from farther back now, um, having to do with Hurricane Katrina. Um, remember that hit the, uh, the southern United States back early 2000s, and there was this uh, Chicago Tribune article I came across where a guy, a, a pastor out there, was teaching his first sermon after Hurricane Katrina hit, and he was preaching to 300 people in a church that he normally was teaching to 3,000 people on a, on a, on a Sunday. Um, and he said, you know, well, we've successfully planted people all over the United States at this point because his whole congregation was scattered. And then he said, we used to sing that Jesus is all we need. And then he said, now he's all we've got. And, 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 you know, we love to sing that, that Jesus is all we need to. I, I love singing worship songs that talk uh, about that theme. But in times of plenty, in, in, in times of prosperity, when everything is going well, we, you know, we remind ourselves that, that we have more than we need. We remind ourselves and we declare that Jesus really is 
all that we need. But then when, when all of that is stripped away, Jesus is all we have. And, and that can be a much more challenging thing for us as Christians. And, and at the same time, however, it could be, you know, that sometimes, maybe not in that scenario every time or, or at all, but there are situations in our lives where the Lord just begins to strip things away from us. Or he allows things, allows almost everything or literally everything from the world's perspective to be stripped away for the specific purpose of him being all that we have. Now, understand that, you know, living in America today, at this very moment, we, we have it much, far, far better than, than much, if not all the rest of the world. Nonetheless, it feels like, and for a number of years now, but it, it feels this way, like we are in one of those moments, even in America, at least spiritually, where Jesus is all we have to hold on to. It's not a lot of good that we can just find in the news and go like, okay, well, you know, that's the fruit of a Christian nation. We, we have Christ, and that's all we got because we belong to him. And praise the Lord for that, that fact, and, and praise the Lord for that aspect of things because Jesus is exactly what the world needs, what our, what our country needs. And so praise the Lord that we always have him. And then in our worst moments, or when everyone's going through their worst moments, he is all we have, but he's what everybody needs. It's Jesus. And the nation of Israel was in that same place, though largely they didn't know it. There were, there were those who knew, like Isaiah, that he had what the nation needed. They needed the Lord. He, who, who, uh, Isaiah knew that what the nation needed wasn't the, the help of some other you know, bigger country or, or army, but they needed the Lord. They needed to repent. They needed to turn to him. And so Isaiah would come again with a prophecy of what they needed to hear. He would come once again with Jesus, like we saw over the last couple of weeks. This same Jesus that we have today, this same Jesus who is coming again, we see here in this prophecy in Isaiah all the way back in the Old Testament. Isaiah would just give them Jesus, just like we should be doing for the world we live in today as well as, as everything for them, for Israel, the northern kingdom especially, and even for Judah is being stripped away or about to be stripped away, I should say, by the, the, the army of the Assyrians. And it's in this first portion of, of the chapter of Scripture that we get to where we really, really just see Jesus. And that that is who Isaiah is giving to this nation that is about to have everything stripped away. So we begin with that uh, verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 9. We read, But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea and the other side of Jordan, or on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. So if you go back to chapter 8, um, the way that it ends, verse 22, it says, Then they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be driven away into darkness. And then these opening verses flow right from what came at the end of chapter 8, specifically here in verse 1, we see that the gloom, again, that came with the Assyrian invasion would not remain would not remain. The, the, the land of Zebulun and of Naphtali up in the northern region of the promised land, uh, the region closest to the Assyrian empire was hit particularly hard when the Assyrians invaded. And so the, the, the gloom and, and darkness that came with the Assyrian flood was especially dark for them. But that gloom would lift one day and they would receive a very special blessing. And this is what we see in verse 2. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the, the light will shine 
on them. That verse might sound familiar for the the New Testament Bible students because we read in Matthew chapter 4, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, speaking of, of, of Jesus, of course, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, like we just read, right? And then Jesus says, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. And if you if you Read this in, in Matthew. You see that the, the L is capitalized in light there. The shadow, those who, who upon who sat in uh, the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so this was fulfilled in Christ. The light of the world came and, and blessed this, this land. And as we know, Jesus spent most of his time in in ministry in this region, which truly was a a special blessing for the land of Zebulun and and Naphtali. And it's been said of these verses, it is as though Isaiah could look down through the ages and see the Lord Jesus full of grace and truth, making known the wonders of God's redeeming love to those who heard him gladly and found him the light of life. And so we see that Isaiah right away giving them Jesus. But this is one of those messianic prophecies that looks to to both his his first and second coming. And from this moment, when the light of the world shows up in the land of Zebulun and of Naphtali, Isaiah jumps past Israel's rejection and crucifixion of their Messiah to the time when they will once again be called the people of God of God. Verse three, you shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and cloak uh, rolled in blood will be for burning fuel for the fire. Ron, uh, Pastor Ron talked about this a couple weeks ago with Gog and Magog and how there's going to be these people uh, in Israel in, during the tribulation or around, around the battle of, of Gog um, and, and Magog who are just picking up you know, supplies and weapons and people from the invading army and just burning them, just getting rid of them through these pyres, essentially. And in, in these verses, though, primarily they speak of joy and, and, and a victory for the people of God. Israel and Judah as one will rejoice before the Lord Jesus Christ with great joy as a people who have experienced a great victory and are dividing the spoils. That, that battle of Gog and Magog, of course, immediately proceeds um, in, in you know, Jewish history, Israeli history going forward, them receiving their Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they will, as one, rejoice before the Lord before Jesus Christ with great joy as a people who have experienced a great victory and are dividing the spoils as a people who have just reaped a bountiful harvest. This speaks of the nation of Israel finally experiencing what we as born again believers have in Christ right now. That victory, that, that, that joy that we have in the Lord. And we look around our world and our, our country today and there are are, are a bunch of you know different emotions that that come. We have all kinds of feelings about what we see around us: worry, fear, we, we burden, oppression, and on and on and on. But we don't need to worry. You know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and, and everything's going to be taken care of. 
We don't need to worry. We don't need to be afraid. Christ has given us victory over this world, over sin and, and death. And he is our joy. He is our hope and our, our confidence. And so we sit together with him in the heavenly places. We, we are more than conquerors through him, the word tells us. One day the remnant of Israel will know these things too. We, we know this. God's word is telling us here. He is not finished with his people Israel. And that's what Isaiah looks to. But he isn't finished talking about our Messiah yet. So we continue from there in verse 6. And we read, For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Some translations have it, his name will be called Wonderful, comma, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Here, and that's what the New King James says here in the NASB. It's Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Both work. When it comes to Wonderful and Counselor or Wonderful Counselor, both work and are biblical. And in these verses, in this verse here, verse 6, specifically we get a good look into both who our Lord Jesus is and what his government is like. And going into verse 7 as well in a little bit. But first looking at who he is here, he is both God and man, we see in verse 6. A child is born. We saw in chapter 7 that his name would be called Emmanuel and that he would be born of a virgin. Um, we saw that prophesied there. He was born of a woman as a man. He, is, he, was, he was fully human. A child is born and a son is given. And so it is not that a child was born only. That child is the only, is also, I should say, the, the only son of God who was given for us that all who might believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He is completely man and he is completely God, both God and man. The word who is God became flesh and dwelt among us. Isaiah is just giving them Jesus. And then it says his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. We can, these are, every single one of these names is a reference to God. Remember in the, in the Old Testament names were often, uh, the Old Testament names were often given to describe the character of a person. And that's what we see here. The idea isn't that these are just literal names of the Messiah that, that he made up or that, Isaiah made up as much as it's that these are aspects of who he is and, and what he does. This is who the child who is born, the son who is given will be and who he already is from eternity past. They are aspects of his character. Now, can you call our Lord Jesus wonderful or, or counselor? And so, of course you can. Of course we can. But do we call him these things just because they are his name? No, we don't. We call him wonderful because truly he is wonderful. There, there is none as wonderful as he is. We should be filled with wonder when we see him, when we, when we consider him. And again, going back to the, the, the point that these are all biblical names of God and aspects of God, when we look at Judges 13... We see, this is with, uh, the beginning of the story of Samson in the book of Judges, and we see Manoah, his, his father, having the angel of the Lord appearing to him, and an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and Manoah asks him, what is your name? Because he's telling him, your wife who is barren is going to conceive and bear a son and all this stuff, and it's going to be Samson. Um, and the, uh, so Manoah asks him, what is your name? And the angel of the Lord, the Lord Jesus himself, responds saying, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Just wonderful. There is none as wonderful as he to the point that wonderful is his name. We should be filled again with wonder when we see him or, or consider him. We call him counselor, not just because it's his name, but because he is our great 
high priest. He is our advocate. He is the one mediator between us and our Father in heaven. Psalm 119 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. John 14, 6 says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He is the one who guides us. He is the one we can, can lean on. He is the one we re- return to when we have lost our way. He is our counselor. We call him mighty God, not just because it's his name, but because he is the one who was and is and is to come. He is the word from the beginning who was, was with God and who is God. He is the one through whom all that has been created was created and for whom all things are created. He is the one in whom uh, and, and for all things consist. He is our mighty God. And again, Jesus says in, in Revelation 1.8, which we're just a couple of months away from, by the way, on Sunday mornings with Pastor Ron, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come, the all mighty. And the name mighty God in our our text here, it's a straightforward declaration of deity, right? The prophesied Messiah is God himself. And scripturally, when we just compare the two things that that we just read with Revelation 1-8 and and, um, Isaiah 9-6 here, scripturally, no matter what you know, certain groups, as we were just talking beforehand, uh, claim, there is no distinction between mighty God and almighty God. They are the same. And Jesus applied to himself in Revelation 1.8 that he is the almighty. It's who he is. It is essentially the same title used for Jesus and Yahweh because they are the same. He is mighty God. Do we call him everlasting father because he is just a, a different manifestation of one God as some believe? No, we don't. Again, it's not necessarily, we don't, we don't call Jesus Father. We don't use that name specifically for him. But of course, it's who he is. Colossians 1.15 tells us he is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of his Father. Anyone who, any who want to know the Father, they need to look to the Son. He's the firstborn over all creation. He's the Son who declares his Father, the Son who, who speaks with the authority of the Father. He is equal to and one in character with the Father. He's, he's the one whom it wouldn't have been considered robbery to make himself equal with God, as we see in Philippians. And yet he humbled himself. Do we call him Prince of Peace simply because it is a title, again, that he was born into, like any other prince? No, that's not the case. It is a, a title he is worthy of because he is the one who who is the source of our peace. He's the one who calms the sea. He's the one who will bring peace to all the earth when he comes to reign. He's the one who said in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. He gives his peace to all those who belong to him and who allow him to be their shelter. That's the peace that passes understanding. He is the source, the the prince of peace. And we could go into each one of these with, you know, a whole teaching series dedicated to each one. So great is the depth of the character of our God. But for tonight, we move on from that, just establishing that this is Jesus he's he's talking about to what we learn in in verse 7 about the government or in these verses combined um, about the government of, of our Lord Jesus as well. And this is a subject that we've talked, uh, that is talked a lot about throughout the Old Testament. But we read there in verse seven of Isaiah chapter nine now. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So we just read in verse six that the government will be on his shoulders. Here in verse seven, we see that he will reign on the throne of David 
as he promised, and he will reign over the land of David, the land of Israel. He will, of course, reign over all the universe, but uh, of his kingdom, there will also be no end. And as you may know, and as we have discussed again, this will happen literally and physically. It will begin when our Lord Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom here on this earth where he will reign for a thousand years. But that's not the full extent of his reign. After that, he will reign over the new heaven and the new earth for all of eternity. And there will be no end to his reign and to his glory. And more than that, His government has also been established here and now in us to a certain extent. Gail Irwin, um, he's the author of a book called The Jesus Style and some other books. He puts it this way, and and this is a long quote I'll read, so just hang in there. Uh, It's worth it. But he says, talking about this government, what might such a government look like? First of all, it would look like its king. Politicians of this day look for what they can get from you. Jesus looks for what he can do for you. Leaders of this day surround themselves with servants. Jesus surrounds us with his servanthood. Leaders of this day use their power to build their empire. Jesus uses his power to wash our feet and make us clean and comfortable. Leaders of this day trade their influence for money. God so loved that he gave. Generals of this day need regular wars to keep their weapons and skills up to date and ensure their own advancement. Jesus brings peace and rest to hearts. The higher the plane of importance one reaches in this world, the more inaccessible he becomes. Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. Leaders of this day are desperate to be seen and heard. Jesus sought anonymity so he could be useful. Obviously, Jesus is not in charge of the halls of Washington, London, Moscow, Baghdad, Paris, or Bonn. So how can we ever believe the government will be upon his shoulders? Actually, he says, his government shows its working in wonderful ways. Whenever I see someone who miraculously leaves a life of drugs or alcohol and is restored to his family and work, I can see that he is now governed by God. Whenever I see loving Christians gently caring for orphans and those rejected by family, I know I am watching people governed by God. Whenever I see people eagerly learning the Bible and joyously praising him, I know who is who the governor is. Whenever I see people give up lucrative careers simply to go and share the good news of Jesus, I know they are governed by God. When I see pastors carefully teach and lead the flock God has given them, I know they are getting signals from the great king. When I see people leave family to live and teach in distant lands because they love the people who have not heard, I know they are governed by God. And then he says, so indeed, the government is alive and working, often silently, mostly unseen. We can be and are by choice governed by God. Hope and joy and peace and rest cover its subjects. Justice Mercy and grace amazingly coexist. He says, I like this kingdom. The borders are open. Come on in. Some aspects of this are certainly fulfilled already in our relationship with Christ. And one day there will be a literal and complete fulfillment as well. Again, in our Lord Jesus Christ. We might think it's all too good to be true, but, but the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. He will see it through. This is his great desire. This is what he is zealous about. Our Lord Jesus is is zealous to get going on on finishing this work. It's like he can't wait to, to get the word from the Father to go and establish his kingdom once and for all. To go and call those to himself who belong to him. And that is a hope that we can bank on. In contrast to the, to the character and, and, the, and the government of our Lord Jesus, we transition from here in, in this opening section of Scripture that, um, to the rest of what we see in chapter 9 and even the opening verses of chapter 10 I'm going to look at. And this section that, we ha- that comes next is known as the speech of the outstretched hand. And it's one of those sections that kind of, it seems like an odd 
place for those first seven verses sandwiched in between what we saw last week and what we see going forward in our text. But it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense that in the midst of of coming judgment and the dark days that are surrounding them, Isaiah would insert, and the Lord through Isaiah would insert himself and insert Jesus Christ. Because that's what he does. Now there are four sections going forward, again including the first uh, four verses of chapter 10 that all end with the phrase, for all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. That, that's the new King, uh, King James Version actually, but it says, um, in, in, in spite of all this, his anger does not turn away and his hand is still stretched out. And in, this is called, again, the, the speech of the outstretched hand. Um, and it's a section that deals with the judgment that's coming, the judgment that would come upon the kingdoms of Israel. And so we begin in, with verse eight, verses eight through 12, and I'm gonna get through this this section quicker than we've been going through those first seven verses. But verse eight, Isaiah chapter nine, the Lord sends a message against Jacob and it falls on Israel. And all the people know it. That is Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria asserting in pride and in arrogance of heart. The bricks have fallen down but we will rebuild with smooth stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. Therefore, the Lord raises against them adversaries from resin and spurs their enemies on. The, The Arameans on the east and the Philistines on the west, and they devour Israel with gaping jaws. In spite of all this, his anger does not turn away and his hand is still stretched out. So that's how these judgments go. It's like, here's a judgment, and even so, his anger is not turned away. Even that is not all that is coming. And and this prophecy was for the the northern kingdom of Israel, the kingdom um, sometimes known simply as Ephraim, whose capital was Samaria. Again, we've talked about this, the northern kingdom. Rather than repenting when the Lord spoke to them, said, we can handle whatever judgment you might bring, God. They were asserting themselves in their pride. You want to tear down our our cities? We'll just replace them. Go ahead. You want to cut down the sycamores? We'll just plant cedars. We, We can handle whatever you can throw at us. And so the Lord would bring wave after wave of judgment against them. And the, the, the Syrians, who were their allies, would turn on them. The Philistines would pile on as well. We know that this would, would all be in addition to the great Assyrian invasion that was about to come. The northern kingdom would not be able to withstand in, in this time of judgment. And it would not stand. And that's the way that the Lord's judgment is. There is none who can stand except for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so the Lord speaks, the Lord judges, but the people do not repent. And so his judgment would keep coming. And then we read again for the first time there in verse 12, in spite of all this, his anger does not turn away and his hand is still stretched out. Verse 13, yet the people do not turn back to him who struck them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. So the Lord cuts off head and tail from Israel, both palm branch and bulrush in a single day. The head is the elder and honorable man, and the prophet who teaches falsehood is the tail. For those who guide this people are leading them astray, and those who are guided by them are brought to confusion. Therefore, the Lord does not take pleasure in their young men, nor does he have pity on their orphans or their widows. For every one of them is godless and an evildoer, and every mouth is speaking foolishness. In spite of all this, his anger does not turn away, and his hand is still stretched out. So the, the, the leaders, it's not, there, there would be none who can escape. The leaders were in the same boat. They they led the people astray and they were cut off because they were all hypocrites and evildoers. But this was not good enough either. 
the people still refused to turn to the Lord. And so we read, in spite of all this, his anger does not turn away and his hand is still stretched out. Verse 18, for wickedness burns like a fire. It consumes briars and thorns. It even sets the thickets of the forest aflame and they roll upward in a column of smoke. By the fury of the Lord of hosts, the land is burned up and the people are like fuel for the fire. No man spares his brother. They slice off what is on the right hand, but still are hungry. And they eat what is on the left hand, but they are not satisfied. Each of them eats the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh devours Ephraim and Ephraim Manasseh. And together they are against Judah. In spite of all this, his anger does not turn away and his hand is still stretched out. And so the the wickedness of the people, it, it wasn't just that they were, you know, backsliding a little bit. It was that the the wickedness was out of control, like a wildfire. Like a a fire that it just has to burn itself out. It can't be put out. It's it's all consuming. And and like we you saw here in in Lahaina, living in California for myself with all these these recent fires over the the last decade or so, we, we understand the picture. This was a picture of their, their wickedness. And wickedness, ungodliness, it, it, it reigns among the people. And it's consuming the nation so that the tribes of the, of the northern kingdom begin to turn on each other. And then they turn on the southern kingdom of Judah as well. And there is no repentance. There is no wickedness. Uh, or, or there is wickedness is just burning through the hearts of the people and the nation as a whole. And so in spite of of what the Lord has already done. His anger does not turn away and his hand is still stretched out. And then we'll go ahead into chapter 10 as well. Verse one, woe to those who enact evil statutes and to those who constantly record unjust decisions so as to deprive the needy of justice and rob the poor of my people of their rights so that widows may be their spoil and that they may plunder the orphans. Now what will you do in the day of punishment and in the devastation which will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave your wealth? Nothing remains but to crouch among the captives or fall among the slain. In spite of this, his anger does not turn away and his hand is still stretched out. And that's what it comes to. That's what the end of this would be. That there would be no place for any in all of the northern kingdom of Israel to, 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 to be. Nothing remains but to crouch among the captives who are being carried off to Assyria as, as slaves or to fall among those who are killed. Those were the options. And really this this kind of final section focuses in on those, those leaders who in their pride and, and selfishness legalize their sin and, and their oppression of the poor and the injustice they do against the fatherless. Who would be on their side when they had completely alienated the people they lead? Not God. God's bringing the judgment. They're not turning to him. What power would they have when they were overthrown? They they don't even realize that the only reason they are standing at all at this point is because of the Lord. And the Lord tells them, all I have to do is remove my hand of protection and you will be bowing before your enemies as slaves or you will be killed. And that's what's going to happen. But even now, they will not repent and turn to the Lord. Remember, he's saying this before this comes, before the judgment comes. But they will not repent. And so we read, for the fourth time, in spite of all this, his anger does not turn away. And his hand is still stretched out. One Bible commentator says, it makes perfect sense for this message of coming judgment to follow the announcement of the Messiah. 
He is, his coming was announced, but the people were not ready for him. And the predicted judgment would come before they were ready. And I don't know about you, but as I read through those, those four sections that followed the prophecy um, of our Lord Jesus Christ, I was comparing them to what's going on in our world and our nation today. And you just go through and you just start checking the boxes like, yep, yep, that's happening, that's happening too, and so on. And you just keep going and you see it. And then I read that quote that I just read to all of you and I thought, man, you know, what would, what would our country be like? Not even the, the, the world, but what would our nation be like? What would it look like at this very moment if all of us as citizens of this nation and our leaders all together had repented of sin and turned toward the Lord 20 years ago? Or, or even five years ago? Or 10 years ago? Would we ever have gotten to this point? Where, where we see so much division and hate and fear and sin is just like a wildfire? Will we have ever gotten to this point where even, even the church is largely divided along political lines or, or where we stand on things that are clearly forbidden in Scripture, that are clearly called sin in Scripture? I don't, I don't think so. Had we repented a year ago, would we be in this place? I don't think so. And so we have here in the, the opening verses of our text tonight, the solution that we all need too. When the darkness seems to be closing in and it seems that the only news is bad news, remember the one who is called Wonderful where wisdom and a sound mind are needed to just even get through the day with all the noise and all the deceit that's always just bombarding us, go to the counselor and be led by him alone. When you genuinely fear that, that there is no way out of the situation we're in, look to the mighty God, our Lord Jesus, through whom all things are possible when we feel like we need to prioritize and need solutions for the here and now. This is all that matters. Is right. Yes, we want to lead people to Christ, but this we got to deal with this first because things are so bad. Remember that the kingdom we belong to is an everlasting kingdom. That our God, our, our salvation, our hope are all everlasting. And when we look at the world around us and see so clearly the need not for world peace or worldly peace, but for his peace, go to the source of true peace, the Prince of Peace, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I know that that many of you who are tuning in tonight online, that you guys who are here in the room tonight have a desire to have an impact on the world we live in. That for many of us, that's why we do what we do, who have a desire to do something within your sphere of influence that will help in the challenges that we are dealing with as a church and as a nation and just as humanity right now. The best thing that you can do personally is to realize the signs of the times we are living in and in the words of Jesus himself, in Luke 21, 28, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. He, he's close. Draw near to him. Keep your eyes on him. Know that he is your hope and your future. Be ready. As we just said, that, that Israel, that this is a call for them to prepare. This was a call for them to turn to the Lord. But he came before they were ready to do that. And they were scattered and they were killed and they were taken away captive. And I know that with, with, with prophecies like what we have in the first part of our chapter tonight, or like we looked at with the Emmanuel prophecy in chapter 7, we, we tend to think of the first coming of Christ. You know, these, these are like, these are Christmas texts. 
These are typically taught on Christmas Eve services. That's where many of us probably is the only place that we've heard them taught. The child was born. You know, the son was given, and rightly so, of course. But that's not where these prophecies end. In, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus tells his disciples that they will receive the Holy Spirit and power will come upon them to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. And then you read in Acts chapter 1, verse 9, this is the New King James. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So these, these are the last words. This is the last thing that Jesus says to them. And then he ascends to his father. He goes back to heaven. And after he ascends, they are, the, the disciples are, are they're just like left standing there looking up. And you, can, and you can picture them with these looks of amazement. These, you know, their jaws are hanging low. They're just like, what is this, this amazement on their faces at what they just witnessed? And you get the sense that there was this kind of like what now vibe going on was, that was going around. And then we continue in Acts 1.10 and we read, And while, there, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. So they didn't notice as they're looking at Jesus' ascend. They didn't notice them at first, but two angels appeared next to them as they were watching Jesus. And afterwards, the, it's the, the angels kind of break the silence. And, and look at what they say. It should be on the screen. Acts 1.11. They say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. In other words, why are you looking back? Why are you looking at the fact that he has left when you should be looking at the fact that he's coming now? That was the very moment where the, the, the doctrine of, of you know, imminency, of the imminent return of Christ began among them and began among the people of God. As soon as he left, they're being told, look, he's coming. And not someone else, not a different Messiah, not the true Messiah, well, in the true Messiah, but not because he was the false Messiah or something like that, but this same Jesus. This Jesus that we read about today in the prophecy of Isaiah is not only the child who was born and the son who was given, this same Jesus is coming again. Wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. That is who's coming again for us. And you need to understand and believe that. I, I was talking to, to, to Pastor Ron the other day and we just had this, this thought about what the church would, would be like if all if we all believed that this same Jesus was coming again and at any moment, it'd probably look a lot different, wouldn't it? I'm talking about the church in general, but I'm talking about, you know, Calvary Chapel Hilo too and whatever specific church you're, you're tuning in from. If we believed that this same Jesus was truly coming at any moment, we'd probably be more concerned for, you know, our unbelieving friends, wouldn't we? There would probably be a greater emphasis on obedience in our lives. We'd probably be more invested in our local church. We always talk about Acts 2.42 when it comes to the early church, and it's, which says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And that, that is the model for the church. How we, we want... A, a church like that. You know, we want to, to be a church like that. And that is a godly desire. But you can't, you're not going to be that church without, you're not going to be the Acts 242 church without Acts 111. That, it was, it, the, the foundation of this 
Acts 2.42 church was Jesus Christ and him crucified and risen again and this same Jesus coming again soon. This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And if we're looking at our text tonight, or scriptures like this, if you're thinking about Emmanuel and Isaiah 7, and all we can think of is that, you know, Christmas is only a couple months away, then we're missing the point of the days we are living in. Because he's coming again. And we should be Christians who live our lives like we believe that this same Jesus is coming again and is coming quickly. And again, it will show. It will show in how we live our lives. This, I got this connection from a Bible I have that belonged to, to my grandfather that I got when he passed away, one of the most godly men I've ever known, and, and just reading notes in the back of his Bible. And one of the things he wrote was, what's the difference between the church today and the church of Acts chapter 2? And he just said simply, he wrote simply, they believed Acts 111. They believed that this same Jesus is coming again and is coming quickly. And we need to believe that too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for who you are, Lord, and just your character. That truly you are our, you are wonderful. You are our counselor. You are everlasting Father, mighty God, Prince of Peace. Lord, we do pray that that you would come quickly. We we pray that your imminent return would would impact our lives and would make us into the people that you desire us to be. We love you. We praise you. We give you all the honor and glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things tonight. Amen. God bless you guys.